Well, welcome to the Department of Continuing Education. Um, I'm Marcus de Sotoy, and I'm, uh, the, I'm a professor of mathematics here at the University of Oxford, and I'm also um, the Simone Professor for the Public Understanding of Science, which I took over from uh, Richard Dawkins. And the professorship is, is shared half with uh, your, the department of your subject, so mathematics, um, but half with continuing education, because, um, of course, that's one of the, the goals of this department, is really to spread uh, the amazing work that's done in science here in Oxford and, and beyond, and to in, engage as many people as possible in, in this wonderful world. Um, it's interesting, uh, I'm a mathematician and um, uh, I think mathematics is an interesting choice for this professorship because I think mathematics actually um, does underpin so many of the other sciences. It is really the, the, the language of science. Um, but it's intriguing. When, when I'm at a party and people ask me what I do and, um, and uh, I say, oh, I'm, I kind of look forward and dread this question because, um, you know, when I say, oh, I'm a mathematician, you can sort of see the look of horror descend over most people's faces and they sort of start backing away and uh, they find their glasses become very empty and they, um, uh, they're, they're, but I'm very persistent, so I chase after them and I try to explain to them that, uh, actually, you no, know, no, mathematicians were a very misunderstood breed. Um, and, uh, uh, I think that most people have this perception that so what I'm doing in my office in the maths department just across the road is sort of doing long division to lots of decimal places. And, uh, you know, that's the, the higher research, the further you go down the... Um, and surely I've been put out of a job now uh, as a, uh, by com a computer. But, um, but I try to explain to them that uh, mathematics is something very different. Um, mathematics is really the science of pattern searching. It's about trying to find the pattern and the logic and the order uh, in this kind of chaotic mess of the world around us and trying to, to read messages into that. And I think it is an incredibly powerful language for actually understanding where we've come from, understanding what happened in the past, but also, perhaps more importantly, in predicting what could happen in the future. And what I want to do for you is to, to take you through some of the stories of how powerful maths is at making predictions, but also the limitations of this language for, for, for actually um, trying to look into the future. I mean, I think that the world is faced with huge uh, kind of problems of things like climate change, um, population growth, uh, virus control, what happens if a virus spreads. And mathematics is a very, um, I think, that uh, ability to be able to read the data that's gone and be able to work out what possibly could happen next um, is, is potentially something that could uh, have a massive impact if we really understand these patterns on the future. In fact, next year, interestingly, 2013, is, is going to be a world maths year, but maths for the earth, the way that the, the mathematics can perhaps answer some of these really big um, problems that, we fa that face us. Um, so as I said, maths is uh, a subject of looking for patterns. Um, and so I'm going to kick off with just uh, uh, warming you up mathematically. So I've got a few challenges for you um, to see how good you are at pattern searching. And so there are these kind of challenges that you probably remember from school a little bit, where you get given a sequence of numbers, uh, and what you've got to do is to try and read some sort of structure, logic, pattern behind them. And then next step is to be able to tell where it's going to go next. Um, so some of you may have a maths degree. Um, uh, you're not allowed to play on the first couple of these, OK? Um, uh, so, uh, but if you haven't got a maths degree, uh, let's say the first uh, sequence. 1, 3, 6, 10, 15, 21, 28. What's the next number in that sequence? Yeah. 34. 30, 36. 36 is the next number in that sequence. Um, how do you get that? Uh, well, what you do is you add uh, the numbers together. So you 1 plus 2 plus 3 plus 4, and that gives you the next sequence. So in fact, we call these the triangular numbers because you can view them very graphically. Uh, if you take a triangle and you add an extra layer on each time, it's the number of stones you need to make larger and larger triangles. Now, interestingly, we, um, uh, we know a lot about this sequence. For example, it, um, there's actually a formula which will tell you what, um, say, the hundredth triangular number is um, without having to do the hard work of, I mean, I could add up the numbers of 1, 2, 3, plus 4, plus 5, all the way up to 100, but uh, mathematicians are rubbish at arithmetic, actually. Um, so I'd probably make a mistake somewhere on the line. Um, and actually, there's, some, uh, there's a very cunning formula. If you put two of these um, triangles together, you'll get a rectangle. 
And counting things in a rectangle is really easy, so you just half the number of the, the, the stones in the rectangle and you get a formula for the triangular numbers. And that will tell you um, the hundredth triangular number, the millionth triangular number, um, without having to do the hard work of adding up all the numbers. I mean, mathematicians love looking for patterns, but we're also very lazy at heart, so we love these kind of shortcut formulas to, to find these numbers. Okay, uh, the next sequence. If you've read the Da Vinci Code, you're not allowed to play on this one. If you've got a maths degree, you're not allowed to play on this one. But if you haven't, uh, then uh, what's the next number in this sequence? Sequence. 34. Yeah, that's right. You, you answered the second sequence first. That's right. That's what you, you, you're jumping ahead. So, um, uh, so yeah, the next uh, number in this sequence is 34. These are a very famous sequence of numbers uh, called the Fibonacci numbers. So, if you haven't got the pattern, um, that what you do is you add the two previous numbers together to the, get the next one in the sequence. So, 13 and 21 is 34. 21 and 34 is 55. And these are probably nature's favorite numbers. You find them all over the natural world. It's absolutely amazing um, in, in sort of pine cones and uh, pineapples. Uh, flowers, if you take a flower and you count the number of petals on that flower, invariably it's a number in the Fibonacci sequence. Sometimes you get double the number because you get sort of two copies of the flower on top of each other. Uh, and if it isn't a number in the Fibonacci sequence, that's because a petal's fallen off your flower, um, <laughs> which is how mathematicians get around exceptions. So, um, uh, interestingly, these numbers sh actually shouldn't be called the Fibonacci numbers. They're named after this Italian mathematician, uh, Fibonacci, uh, uh, from Pisa, uh, 12th, 13th century, who discovered this connection to um, a nature. But actually, they were discovered some time earlier in India, um, by uh, musicians and poets, because they can also be used to count the number of rhythms you can get with long and short beats. So it's interesting that uh, artists actually discovered these before the scientists did. Uh, but they come up all over the place. And again, we actually have a formula for these numbers. Um, it's a slightly more complicated formula involving the golden ratio, which is this, um, the proportions that we like in art and comes up a lot in nature as well. Um, and, and there's still a, quite, quite a few mysteries about these numbers as well. But you can use this formula again I can, to tell what the hundredth Fibonacci number is without having it to add up all the numbers from, from one to a, uh, the pairs all the way up to the hundredth number. So it's a, again a very powerful formula which will tell you quite a lot, but there's still some mysteries about these numbers. Okay, uh, the next sequence. 1, 2, 4, 8, 16. 32. Well, actually, 31 is the next answer in this sequence. Um, so why? 32, of course, is the obvious one. You say, oh, you're, you're just doubling the numbers. But let me tell you why 31 is equally good an answer to this sequence. Because it's describing something which starts off as if it's doubling, but then, and this is the fun thing in math, suddenly you think there's a pattern and it can go in a completely different direction. Um, I mean, if everything was sort of too predictable, it would be boring. And the fun thing about mathematics is there's this kind of curious balance between uh, things that uh, seem to have a lot of structure and then have little surprises in. So I call these the circle division numbers. So what are the circle division numbers? Well, if I take a circle and I put a one point on that circle, I've just got one region. But if I add another point and add, join those up, I've got two regions. Okay, so two dots, two regions. If I put a third dot, uh, I draw, or do I join the dots up, you get a triangle in the middle, three regions around the outside, so that's four regions. Okay, I put another dot, I join all of those up, um, I get this little envelope figure, so four in the middle, four around the outside, eight regions. So you think, okay, I'm starting to spot the pattern here. If you add another dot, you just double the number of regions. Um, seems pretty convincing. And sure enough, you do another one. You take five dots. Um, you join all of those up. You get this uh, five-pointed star, the pentagon. You count the number of regions, 16. You think, okay, I, I really know. I've spotted the pattern. And then this surprise happens. Because if you put six dots on, and I challenge you, you know, on, on a bit of paper later, um, however you arrange them, you cannot get more than 31 regions out of this. Rather surprising. So, um, you know, you think you know what's happening, and then, but, you know, there's a warning here. Patterns might go in sort of strange direction. It can lead you a little bit astray. We have a formula which will tell you the number of regions. It's a little bit more complicated than the other ones. You have to take the number of points on the circle, raise that to the power of four, and then take away a cubic, and blah, 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 blah. But amazingly, this will tell you the number of regions um, that you have um, as you add more and more dots on. Um, okay, uh, the next sequence. Uh, uh, if you've got a math degree, you can play now. Um, uh, so, uh, uh, 2, 9, 10, 11, 13, 16. A little bit more challenging. I thought, oh, this is easy. I know Fibonacci numbers. So. Anyone got a math degree here? You dare own up now, do you? <laughs> 
<laughs> well, um, if you could get the 26 to the next number in this sequence, I, I recommend you buy a lottery ticket um, uh, next week because these were, in fact, the lottery ticket winnings for um, uh, the 28th of September. Um, uh, so, yeah. Another warning here, not everything does have patterns. Some things are, have genuine randomness in this, and that's all, often important as well when you've got a lot of data. We live in a world of a huge, big data, and sometimes being able to know when something is just random or when there is a signal inside there is really important. So, you know, being able to actually recognize the signature of when something is random is important. Um, you know, unfortunately, I don't have a formula for these. So, you know, if I did, I would not be here now. I'd be on some tropical island enjoying myself. So, um, um, okay, so the next number, next sequence, uh, 2, 3, 5, 7, 11, 13, 17, 19. 23. So these are the prime numbers, yeah. And these, um, these are the primes, these are numbers, I think, which are the most central um, to the whole of mathematics. Um, uh, because they are, I mean, they're the ones I spend a lot of time as a research mathematician here trying to understand, because they're also um, some of the biggest mysteries are about these numbers. We really don't understand them at all. Um, th but they are so important because they really are the building blocks of my subject. Um, uh, if you take a number like 105, that's clearly not prime, it's divisible by 5. Divide by 5, I get down to 21 times 5. 21 is prime, I can divide that into 3 times 7 times 5. But now you've got down to these primes, they're the indivisible numbers. So a prime number is a number you can't divide any further. And for me, that's why I like to call them the atoms of my subject. They're the numbers from which you build all other numbers. So a number like 105, I can break down, it's a molecule, and I break it down, divide it, divide it, divide it, until I get down to these indivisible numbers um, which are the primes which build all the other numbers. So, for example, your telephone number. If you're very lucky, you might have a prime number telephone number. I've always wanted one, and I've never had one. Um, uh, but, uh, you know, if it's not, then eventually, you know, you'll keep on dividing it, dividing it, and eventually you'll get down to these primes. Um, and, and so, for me, they are a little bit like the periodic table of my subject. I mean, the periodic table is the most fundamental thing, really, in the subject of chemistry. It's um, an amazing discovery by Mendeleev, this kind of pattern that exists behind these, these uh, atoms, so that you can use that pattern to predict, in a very mathematical way, new elements inside there. And now we have a list of um, uh, basically uh, up to 120, a few stay unstable towards the end. But for me, these prime numbers are really like our periodic table. But the primes, uh, they're very, very challenging as a sequence of numbers. Because if I write the primes and I uh, try, and try and spot some sort of pattern inside them, there seems to be no pattern there at all. I, I, I kind of feel like they're the heartbeat of my subject. So I, I, here I've written it as a heartbeat. So um, every time the line runs over a prime number, it kind of beats um, like, like the, the heartbeat of this subject. Um, but uh, when you look at this, it's, uh, it's very hard to predict when the heart's going to beat next. I mean, this is a subject which needs to visit the cardiac department. It's sort of, um, uh, you know, you get sort of big gap, 23, and then a big gap, then 29, 31, these twin primes, and another big gap. And actually, as you go on further and further, it seems more and more challenging to be able to predict where it's going to, when, when it's going to beat next. Um, and it, intriguingly, mathematicians sort of feel there's, there's much more in common uh, between the prime numbers and these lottery ticket numbers then between the primes and these things like the Fibonacci and triangular numbers. I mean, we don't have a formula which will tell you the hundredth prime number in a kind of a, 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 as an efficient way as this. Um, we really don't. And, and when you look at the structure of them, they have, they have a lot of a sense of randomness in there. And we've been studying these things um, really for, 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 for millennia. In fact, the first people to study these uh, numbers, in fact, uh, yeah, who, 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 who do you think the first people just study prime numbers were? The Greeks? Ancient Greeks, maybe? Indian. The Indians. Maybe the Indians, because they were very good at math. They, yeah, um, uh, Mesopotamians? Yeah, they did a lot. They, 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 they did uh, amazing sort of things on astronomy with numbers and things. But uh, actually, Chinese? Chinese? Yeah, they, they explored these numbers as well, but none of those, actually. There was another. Egyptian. No, it was actually an insect. <laughs> um, uh, so this insect uh, actually started studying the primes long before we did. Um, this insect has a very curious life cycle. Um, it's, a, it's a cicada. It lives in the forest in North America. I mean, you have cicadas all the way around the world, but these ones are unique to North America. They have this extraordinary life cycle. Um, they uh, hide underground doing absolutely nothing for 17 years. And then on the 17th year, almost on the same day, 
they emerge en masse into the forest. That's the extraordinary um, I event. Um, and they uh, sing. This is the sound of one cicada. Let's see if I can make this play. Um, uh, the had to imagine this multiplied by uh, several million. It's the forest is absolutely full of these things. Uh, residents generally move out of the, uh, the, the area because it's so unbearable. And they, they party away, they eat the leaves, they, they mate, they, they lay eggs, and then after six weeks of partying, they all die, and the forest goes quiet again for another 17 years before the next generation appears from underground. Absolutely extraordinary life cycle. First of all, how on earth do they count 17 years? It's very rare that any emerge a year early or a year late. Um, uh, it's not quite clear. There's nothing in the natural cycle which has a 17-year cycle. I mean, 11 years, well, the sunspots maybe, but that'd be very curious if they were able to pick that up underground. But, um, but it, you know, 17 is a prime number. Is that important? Was it just random as a prime? Well, we think, oh, there's another species of cicada in North America which has a 13-year life cycle. In fact, um, I, I got a chance to see those last year. I went out, I was making a program for the BBC called The Code, um, and the, uh, the, around Nashville area, this 13-year cycle of cicadas were, was emerging from the, from the ground. It's absolutely I extraordinary. And, and talking to the residents, you know, they, they remember when they were kids, when they last appeared, and, and you know, they won't appear again for another 13 years. But Around America, you find these different species, some 17, some 13, and you never find 12, 14, 15, 16, or 18. So what is it about the primes which seems to be key to these uh, cicadas? Well, we're not actually too sure, but we think, uh, there's a theory, they think that maybe there used to be a predator that also used to appear periodically in the forest. And the predator used to try and time its arrival to coincide with the cicada. Now, you can do a little thought experiment. Let's, let's make the predator appear every six years. Okay. And the cicada, now we're going to have a cicada which appears every nine years. Okay, well, if you think about that, they meet quite quickly because in year 18, the six-year predator is there and the nine-year cicada is there. And so they get wiped out. Um, if you go down to an eight-year cycle, well, they get to year 24, it's the first number divisible by six and eight, again wiped out. But now I'll take it down to seven, they're appearing more often in the forest, but when do they meet for the first time? The six-year predator and the seven-year cicada? 42. The answer to the life, the universe, and everything, and the survival of this cicada. Um, so 42 years it takes before they actually get in sync. And that means that the cicada has a much better chance of building up, you know, the predator's probably dead by then, it's gone completely hungry. But, um, but it seems like maybe there was a sort of competition in this forest um, where the predator sort of shifted its cycle, the cicada had to move in order to survive. And so, the, you know, there's a message here, if you know your maths, you survive in this world, I think. So um, the cicada knew its primes up to 17, and uh, the predator didn't. And, uh, and so it's got left with this kind of uh, this prime number life cycle. Um, so very curious, but but yes, I think um, uh, actually many of the civilizations that you mentioned um, started exploring the primes um, basically because they are the most basic numbers in our subject. Um, and I would probably credit the ancient Greeks um, with the first really sort of analytical approach to to my subject. I mean. Uh, uh, and, and Euclid in particular um, has the sort of first, I think, the first great theorem of mathematics um, in this wonderful thing called the Elements, the greatest mathematical textbook of all time. Um, and and he, he showed, you know, the chemists, they've got this thing, the periodic table, um, with all the atoms in, they can get it on a nice poster. I mean, maybe mathematicians, we could just do the same thing. You'd just have a big table of all the primes, and if I need to know something about the primes, I go to this table, check it. Um, but Euclid showed that um, anybody who tried to write down the primes in a, in a big table would be writing forever, because um, uh, in one of the... Uh, propositions that he proves in the elements, he, he proves why the primes, they go on forever. You will always find another bigger prime, um, however far uh, you go up. And it, it's a beautiful example of the power of mathematics um, to prove things with 100% certainty. And I think it is something unique about mathematics. Um, if you think about the other sciences, it's really a process of evolution. It's a kind of survival of the fittest theory. And, um, uh, you know, once a, uh, some, uh, a chink, uh, something isn't seen to be quite right, Newtonian physics is just an approximation. You produce relativity. Um, it's, it's very much just kind of evolutionary process. But mathematics is very different. If you think about in mathematics, we still teach our kids the things that were discovered 2,000 years ago by the ancient Greeks. They're as true today as they were 2,000 years ago. And that's the power of proof. In no other science, I think, are we teaching, you know, if you think about 
Greek chemistry was earth, wind, fire, and water were the atoms which make up uh, the, uh, the, uh, the, the uh, molecular, world, molecular world. So I think there is something very powerful about mathematics and the power of proof um, to be able to, to get that sort of uh, that certainty uh, about ideas and the truth. Um, so, so for example, th this is a, a beautiful proof that, there are, uh, that Euclid gave, that the primes go on forever. But despite the fact that he proved that they go on forever, he couldn't find a way to find them. It's a, sort of, a non-constructive proof. So, um, you know, if I, I, if I ask you to find a, a billion-digit uh, Fibonacci number, you could use the formula to, to find it. But um, the largest prime number we've so far discovered um, uh, it has uh, nearly 13 million digits. It's pretty big. Uh, it only takes a number with 80 digits to count all the atoms in the observable universe. Um, if I read this number out aloud to you, it would take me two two months to do it, so um, yeah, I'm not going to do that, don't worry. Um, and interestingly, uh, this, uh, there's actually a project online, if you want to try and help the search for, for big primes, um, there's a little piece of software you can download, and you'll, my computer actually, whilst it's being idle here, uh, before I move the presentation on, is running this program in the background, looking for, for more primes out there. And there are, there are prizes out there, the person that this guy, who discovered, and it's just amateurs doing this, the person who discovered this prime passed, the t it was the first person to pass the 10 million digit barrier, and there was a prize of $100,000 for um, the first person to pass that. And I think the next, uh, it's a 100 million digit, there's um, 150,000 pound uh, uh, dollar prize uh, for that one. But I suspect actually probably your electricity bill will be more than that um, <laughs> if you run this program. Um, so I mean, but, but, but it kind of, I think, is indicative of, of how little we understand these numbers, that although we know that they go on forever, this is, this is the largest one we know. We know there are infinitely many more after this, but we haven't a clue where they are. Um, in fact, there's a, a million dollar prize. It's one of our greatest unsolved problems, something called the Riemann hypothesis, um, which is trying to understand some sort of structure and, you know, wh how are these numbers laid out? Is there genuine randomness in them? Um, what, what is the sort of st structure hiding behind there? And, and there's, there's a million dollar prize. It's one of the th things called the Millennium Prizes. Um, there were seven prizes offered by the Clay Institute. Um, uh, 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 Landon Clay uh, loved mathematics and wanted to sort of uh, uh, reward uh, the discoveries of mathematics, but actually I think most math, I, I would personally sell my soul, I'd sell, you know, I, I'd, I'd, I'd pay a million dollars to find the solution to this, because it's such a, um, a, a, an extraordinary challenge. Um, but as I said, they, they look a little bit random, but, um, uh, but actually even things which are random, rather surprisingly, mathematics can have something to say about. It was kind of one of the breakthroughs in the kind of 17th century that uh, you know, randomness was considered perhaps something that mathematics could have nothing to say about. But, but even when things are random, we can actually um, use mathematics to make predictions. So, so I'm going uh, so to run a little uh, experiment with you just to show the power of mathematics to, to perhaps make predictions about uh, how you behave as uh, random individuals. Um, okay, so I, one of the best examples of randomness is the, the lottery. So you hopefully will come in with a lottery slip. Um, and so we're going to run a little lottery here, the continuing education lottery. I'm afraid there's no sort of million dollar prizes, just the honour of perhaps getting as many as possible. So could you pick six numbers, this is like the UK National Lottery, um, you have to six, pick six numbers from the numbers from 1 to 49. And, and then what I'm going to do is to use a little bit of uh, mathematics to make some predictions about the numbers that you chose. Okay, so um, you've chosen your numbers. Okay, um, if, uh, uh, so I'm, I'm going to uh, get somebody to choose some numbers here and we'll um, uh, then see how close you get. So, so don't ring the numbers after they come out of the box. I'll be able to... <laughs> and you can actually use mathematics to tell that, of course. You know, a, a lot of uh, uh, fraud detection is about um, you know, strange patterns emerging in your behaviour. So uh, would you do the honours of choosing uh, the first number? So what have we got? 17. 17. Oh, right. Very good choice. Um, uh, I play for a football team, and actually I play in the number 17, so it's my favourite prime number. So, um, uh, here we go. Next one. 35. 35. Okay. There you go. 23. 23. Nice. Another prime number. So. Don't worry, they're not all primes, as you've seen. 24. 24! Yeah, intriguing. Okay, let's push that one on. Good. The fifth number. Anyone getting really excited? 43. 43, yeah, you seem to be obsessed with it. That's 
good lot of primes coming out. Um, here we go. Actually, 43 is a, a, one of the twin primes. So primes that can be the closest two primes can be are two apart, 41 and 43. So, in fact, I have two twin girls, um, and I wanted I was trying to persuade my wife that we should call them 41 and 43. But, uh, <laughs> I she, <laughs> she wouldn't let me. So they're my private names for them. So, and the last one. Anybody can kind, of, kind of whoop with six. Number 11. There we go. Okay, excellent. So let me uh, do a recap of that. Um, 11, 17, 23, 24, 35, and 43. Okay, now I want you all to stand up, please. And I'm going to make some predictions about what you chose. So halfway through the lecture, you need to get your blood running again. So, you know, get those good. Um, so I'm going to make some predictions about what I think you would have chosen. So I think that, I think half of you will have not got any number um, right at all. So if, please sit down if you didn't get any of those six numbers right at all. <coughs> the mathematics just predict with, a, with a, a sort of, uh, any size of students that half of, half of the numbers that you would have chosen. Well, actually, you look quite lucky here. Mm, right, okay. Um, right, so uh, the next one, uh, so uh, there's, uh, I, I think there's um, uh, one, one in eight of you should have got two or more numbers right. So, so uh, probably about 160 people here. So um, maybe let's sit, let's sit you down if you only got one number right. And so we should have had about I've got to do some maths now. 20. <laughs> Just need, 20 people. So let's see: 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19. Uh, uh, you're all standing at the back because you're members of the department. So that was pretty close. <laughs> 19, yeah, so, that, so the math is pretty, doing pretty well. Okay, what about, uh, I would predict that probably only about three of you will stay standing because it's uh, about um, uh, uh, one in 50 chance you get three. So sit down if you've got two numbers right. Let's see how many are standing with uh, who got three numbers right. Okay, so there you go. So maths is doing pretty well. Now there's there's four of you still standing, um, but I would suspect that I'll wipe the lot of you out with the next one. So um, uh, sit down if you only got three numbers right. Yeah. So uh, in an audience of a thousand, I might have one of you still standing. Um, but five numbers right. Well. Uh, uh, I need 50, I, I mean, we're, we're planning to do um, uh, the Department of Continuation, Continuing Education some, some mass lectures with huge numbers via the internet. So if I run this experiment, I might have perhaps one person uh, uh, dialing in and saying they got five numbers right. And six numbers, well, you know, there is a one in a 14 million chance of winning the national lottery each weekend. So, um, uh, so you know, I've, I've, even online, it would be great if we had one person winning. But of course, you know, that number of people play the lottery we each week that, you know, people do win because uh, there are more than 14 million people probably playing. Now, give me some sense of the scale of these numbers because there's one thing that we're very bad at. It's assessing, you know, after a certain while, billion, trillion, you know, it's basically infinite. Um, uh, if, I chose, if I bought a lottery ticket every week, um, then after a year I might have got three numbers right. It would take me 20 years buying a lottery ticket every week to get four numbers right. Now the first thing that, uh, so if, if, uh, uh, okay, how many, 55, I think you have to go back to something like King Alfred, okay, if King Alfred had bought lottery tickets, um, uh, you know, by now he might have got five numbers right. And, and, and to give you a sense of scale of this one, if the first thought that Homo sapien had was, oh, I must go and buy a lottery ticket, uh, uh, by now he might have, or she might have won uh, once um, and got all six numbers right. So that gives a sense of the scale of these things. So, okay, so math is quite good at sort of um, uh, uh, telling you things about large numbers and of uh, people and things like that, but um, how can maths really help you? I, you know, I'm sure you are dying for me to tell you how to use maths to win the lottery. Well, I can't produce a formula, as I said, to, to pull these numbers out, but what we can use mathematics for, and the maths of randomness, is to help anyone who plays to avoid what happened in the ninth week of the National Lottery. Because in the ninth week of the National Lottery, something rather bizarre happened. Um, that week, uh, 133 people got the right answer. I mean, there was a kind of feeling like, oh, did, you know, was there some sort of insider thing going on here? Uh, you know, were a lot of people Camelot playing? Um, no, what happened that week, and it's an indication of actually how bad we are at randomness. We're so addicted to patterns that even when you're choosing your numbers, you've probably left some sort of patterns sitting inside there. And what we tend to do when we choose random numbers is that we tend to spread them out. 
we sort of spread them out now kind of neatly uh, across the page. So if you look at the numbers that week, they were all kind of neatly laid out. There was lucky number seven, and um, then it was all sort of quite nice on the sort of lottery ticket. And, and so that's the reason, you know, uh, I mean, the people who won that week must have been kicking themselves. You know, they're sitting on the settee and these numbers come, yes, I've got 600, they're going to be a millionaire. And, you know, they, they walk away, they phone up and find they have to share their winnings with another 132 people. I mean, they only won 100,000 pounds that week and, and you know they were hoping to be a millionaire i mean i wouldn't say no to hundred thousand pounds but when you've got all six of numbers right and it's going to take you know another the lifetime of homo sapiens so go do it again you would get a bit frustrated so um and it was because they were rather nicely laid out and the intriguing thing is that um actually randomness uh uh and this is what people tend not to realize is that randomness actually quite often clumps things together. I mean, um, so uh, let me, oh, I'm going to do a test on how good you were at randomness. Uh, I want you to stand up if you've got two consecutive numbers in your lottery ticket, something like 17 and 18, or uh, 3 and 4. So, okay, so that's quite, quite a few of you are standing. But actually, the mathematics says that half of you, Half of you should be standing, because half of the possible uh, six numbers that could come out of here have two consecutive numbers. So it's kind of an indication. This is, this is probably, uh, uh, you know, it's, it's pretty good, but it's not half. Okay, you can sit down. Um, uh, and and, it is, and then in, as an indication, I mean, look at those numbers before the, the eighth week and the tenth week. The eighth week, you had 21 and 22. Tenth week, the week after, you had 30 and 31, and indeed, what did we have? We had uh, 23 and 24 coming out. So half the number of lotteries I could run here will have two numbers clumped together. But people tend not to do that. They tend to think, oh yeah, well, I've got 23, 24 is not going to come out. Um, and so actually, here's a, here's a strategy for the National Lottery. Um, if you're choosing numbers, then clump them together, because if you do win, which is highly unlikely, but um, if you do win, then at least you won't be sharing it with another sort of 132 people. Um, so that is a, is a strategy, but it, is, it goes against um, what the norm is, that people don't really do randomness very well. However, um, how many of you chose 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6? Put your hand up if you chose 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. Good, yes, yes. These are the true mathematicians in the room, because these people know that 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6 is as likely as anything else. I mean, very unlikely, but actually, you know, when, if you choose that, you say, oh, that's never going to come out. Well, unfortunately, so are your numbers. They're <laughs> not going to come out. But don't choose those numbers, because interestingly, 10,000 people a week in the UK choose the numbers 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. Because I think it just goes to show actually how intelligent the UK population is, that they know that that's as likely as anything else. Um, um, so, so the mathematics of randomness is very powerful, and it, it, it's something that uh, gets used a lot. Um, also, knowing when people are not being random and they're trying to be, um, uh, be careful with your tax forms, because um, actually there are a lot of mathematicians in, employed by the tax authorities who can pick up the fact that you're faking your um, expenses um, because of things like this, it's very hard to choose random numbers um, uh, and there's something called Benford's Law which um, uh, they use to actually pick up. Uh, I mean, uh, uh, in, if, if any of you got six numbers right, I'd be pretty you know, you know, convinced that actually there's something uh, fishy going on. So, so randomness is something even mathematics can have some say at. But there's one area of math uh, sort of uh, the natural world that mathematics, um, although we have a language for it, finds very difficult to navigate. And this is the, the mathematics of chaos theory. Um, chaos theory, you've probably heard quite a lot about. Chaos theory is um, uh, an area of mathematics which was first discovered um, really by Henri Poincaré, um, a French mathematician uh, beginning of the uh, 20th century he discovered this. Um, it was actually a problem that he was working on um, set by the King of Sweden, um, which was to determine whether our solar system um, is stable or not. Um, so our, our solar system uh, is, uh, you know, seems to be uh, ticking on for, for, for many millennia, sort of in its nice regular way, but is there some point at which um, perhaps our solar system will kind of fly apart because uh, of some sort of irregularity in it? And so uh, Honoré Poincaré was trying to understand. So uh, in fact, if you have two planets, sure enough, Newton proved that they will just, so the, to the end of time, just carry on doing ellipses around each other, and, and that, that nothing unexpected will happen. But what Poincaré discovered is that as soon as you put another planet inside there, so three planets, 
something it's impossible to really tell. So you could have a system um, where the three planets are very regularly doing some sort of pattern around each other, and you can prove that that will go on to the end of time. Um, but there are other systems where um, uh, the thing looks very stable, it seems to be re re repeating itself over and over and again, um, but then just a very small perturbation can send the system uh, uh, flying off uh, in a completely different direction. So you really don't want to be living in this planetary system, because, you know, they're, they're, all of these planets go... And so the question was, you know, it, our, our, our system, we've got a lot of planets, not just three, um, it, it's... Is it going to be stable to the end of time, or is there some sort of instability? And what Poincaré discovered is that actually a very small change in uh, the initial conditions of where the planet is can cause the thing to be, go from stability to complete instability. Um, and uh, there's a lovely example of this actually. Um, uh, so, it's, uh, so this is the signature of chaos theory. That chaos theory, you might have very good equations for, chaos, uh, for, for a system, but they may be so sensitive to very small changes that um, you know, uh, uh, a very small change in the, uh, the location of Venus could actually cause the thing to go in a completely different direction. So there's a very nice example of this I mean, uh, uh, in terms of a pendulum. So a pendulum you think of generally as a very regular thing because a pendulum we use to keep track of time, it's so regular. But I've got a slight variation on a pendulum which is a, um, a, a double pendulum. So this is a bit like a, a leg where it's got this joint in the middle here. Uh, let me test this thing out here. Uh, this thing, although it looks looks very simple. In fact, you can write down the mathematical equations for this thing. It's just two rigid bodies connected. Um, it's extremely difficult to predict. Um, and in fact, um, even if you do, it, uh, you run the model once, so here we go. Ooh. Ooh. You know, being able to predict, could you predict which way that's going to go around? Oh, you know, it's still going, is it going to... Yep, there it goes again. I mean, it's absolutely extraordinary. Um, uh, you know, just such a simple thing. Two, two pieces of metal stuck together. But, you know, if I tried to repeat that as well, so I headed about here, um, uh, try and repeat the same sequence. Oops. You have to be very careful. This is vicious, actually. Um, uh, let me just see whether I can... So we had it. This is my favourite desktop toy, actually. I, said, uh, I can play with this for hours, because it's so unexpected. And, um, uh, uh, is it... Oh, it's trying to go through again. Um, let, let's do a really big one. So, um, so, you know, something so simple... Oh. I mean, it, it, if you want one for Christmas, there some, I've got it in a thing called chaoticpendulums.com. I mean, it's, it's um, uh, a lot of fun, but you know, that's extraordinary. And it, it, you could never repeat, probably, even if you tried, you'll have a small little bit of um, a difference from what you did before, and you'll get completely different behavior each time. And there's an interesting example of that, actually, um, with a different sort of pendulum. And there's another desktop toy you can actually buy, um, which is a, a, you have a, a metal pendulum and three magnets. And what you do is you just set the, the pendulum off and it sort of whizzes around and, and, and eventually tends towards one of the magnets. Um, but here I ran uh, three computer simulations of this where I all, started the pendulum at almost the same place, just very small, you know, like the tenth decimal place, I just shifted the location of it. Um, and just that small change completely changes where the, the pendulum ends up. The first one it ends at the blue magnet, second one the red magnet, third one the yellow magnet. Uh, and this is the trouble that even though I have the equations to describe this, if I don't know, uh, even, uh, you know, I, you can never know the precise location of these things. You know, it might be the 50th decimal place will still cause a different behavior. Here's a picture of, of describing the behavior of this pendulum. So basically, if I start the um, pendulum over a red region, it means that it's going to end up at the red uh, magnet. And if I started it, so for example, here's a red magnet. Sure, if I'm just very close to the red magnet, let it go, it's just going to swing and, and, and end up there. Blue, yellow. But look at these regions here. Uh, this is basically an example of something you've probably heard of called a fractal. A fractal is a, sh a kind of geometric shape which has infinite complexity. However far you zoom in, it never seems to simplify. So in this region here, um, basically, uh, you know, it, it runs, well, let's choose this, this here. So you run from red to yellow to blue to yellow to blue, red, red, uh, and just a very small change, and the, the thing ends up in a completely different direction. Now, unfortunately, these kind of equations really control very many things in the natural world, and one in particular is the weather 
of course. So this is why we have this thing called the butterfly effect, which you may have heard about, which is the idea that the, the equations for this weather are actually not too complicated, but they're so sensitive to these small changes that um, I've been along to the, the Met Office and seen their models running, and what they do is that they, they take the data, um, uh, they read the, the, the temperatures, the wind speeds and things like this, and they, they feed that into the model and they run it, and then they make small changes in these things, because you can never get complete accuracy, and when you run the model you find five days um, the, the predictions are pretty close but after ten days there's just no way you can know where it's going to end up. They run about 50 different models, they're all saying different things. Um, and this is why we have this thing called the butterfly effect because it might be that a butterfly flaps its wings, changes this, this wind velocity in one place by a very small amount and it can cause the, you know, the magnet to go from a red region, a hot day, to a totally blue region, a cold day, just because of that small change. Um, so this is, uh, and it's an important thing sometimes, actually mathematics is a powerful tool even to tell you when you can't know things. I mean, it's sometimes important to know you're in a region, uh, I mean in that uh, computer model, you know, if you're in the Sahara Desert, you're in this kind of region, and if you're um, in Antarctica, you're in this kind of region. But sometimes it's important to know when you're in a region where you can make predictions, and when you're in another region where basically you have to say this is so sensitive that we cannot make predictions. That's, that's as powerful information as well. Um, now this kind of uh, mathematics affects many different uh, sort of issues in the natural world. And one of them affects a very interesting issue about population growth. Um, so uh, there's this very curious uh, question. Uh, so here's a question for you. Um, uh, which of these animals um, throws themselves over a cliff in a mass suicide pack every four years? Um, so uh, any votes for the muskrats? Who think muskrats throw themselves over cliffs every four years. So one, one muskrat fan down here, well maybe not. Um, uh, okay, uh, who thinks, oh, another one of there, uh, voles? Who thinks voles? So, yeah, okay, uh, two voles, okay. Um, um, how about lemmings? Who thinks lemmings? Oh, lots of you going for lemmings. Oh yes, he put up his hand. I think I'll put up my hand. Yes, yeah, so maybe you're following each other like lemmings, but yes, so, so the story is uh, that, yeah, in fact it was that it is lemmings who have this kind of strange behaviour that every four years they throw themselves over a cliff and a suicide pact. Now the reason this story came about was because um, uh, uh, scientists had observed that um, uh, a very strange thing happened to the lemming population every four years, that it just seemed to get obliterated and then it was kind of revived again but every four years it has a sort of cycle where suddenly you find no lemmings around at all and so this theory developed that um, uh, perhaps they were you know, throwing themselves over a cliff. Um, but this then got confirmed um, by an amazing piece of footage um, which was uh, taken by uh, the Walt Disney, I don't know if some of you are old enough to remember, Walt Disney used to make nature programs. Um, and so there's this amazing film called White Wilderness um, where they went out and they actually filmed, they managed to capture these lemmings, um, so here they are, um, so this is lemmings, I think it's in Norway, um, and they, they managed to get footage of these lemmings coming to the edge of the cliff um, and uh, you know, there's the, the sea out there, and suddenly throwing themselves off. So it's an like amazing sort of um, uh, bit of scientific research done here. That um, uh, here they are, and then they 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 die. And they're, 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 there's one here really doesn't want to go. <laughs> but no, unfortunately, yeah, no, I don't want to go. And um, I think eventually he does go. So. Um, <laughs> Now, rather intriguingly, um, a few years ago, um, the cameraman on the shoot came clean. <laughs> um, those lemmings did not want to go over that cliff. Um, in fact, uh, what you can't see is that the, the, the crew had rigged up the spinning turntable um, and uh, there, there was so, uh, somebody putting lemmings on the turntable, and so the ones you saw going over the cliff were in fact, uh, yeah, they, they were on the turntable and springing off. So, um, uh, so it, was, it, it was revealed that in fact this had been a whole setup and fate. Um, but that still left the question about what was it that was um, uh, affecting these lemmings. I mean, that, that certainly was evidence that they were just being obliterated every four years. Well, the intriguing thing is uh, that we've now discovered that it was mathematics that was killing the lemmings. <laughs>
I'm sure most kids at school would yell, oh, God, yeah. <laughs> second that. But, um, but no, there's a mathematical formula um, which actually controls the population growth from one season to the next. And if you run this mathematical formula, you, uh, you start to see some sort of patterns emerging. So, so I'm going to do a little experiment with you, actually, and uh, sort of do a, sort of, um, a slightly simplified version of this um, uh, uh, formula. So basically, um, it's a sort of feedback formula. So you start with um, a certain number of lemmings, um, and then each season, so in the first model I'm going to run, um, each season uh, the lemmings double, but there's not enough food around for everyone to survive. So this formula tells you um, how many lemmings will survive from one season to the next. So, um, so what you do is you take, so you start with the first generation, you double that up, next generation, how many survive in that generation? Well, you take the first generation multiplied by the second generation, multiply those together, divide by 10, and uh, that's the number that won't survive. Okay, so I'm going to run this as a little experiment. I want, to, uh, I need some help. Uh, so I, I need some people to volunteer to be some lemmings. Um, uh, good. So here's one lemming. So well, we've got one lemming. I need, I'm going to start off with two lemmings. So let's just start with two lemmings. So if you'd like to come up on stage, um, can I have a, another uh, lemming uh, volunteer? Great. Excellent. Up you come. Good. All right. Um, it's quite important to have a man and a woman in this, else we'll never get it going. But don't worry, it's a math score. We're not going to do any uh, yeah, biology. That's kind of a, it's like, um, so. Okay, so these um, um, here are my two lemmings. Um, first generation, the next generation, they double up, and we have two more lemmings. So I need two more lemmings to come up to be the next generation. Um, so excellent, good. I'm going to start pointing at people. Anyway. <laughs> so uh, I need one more uh, uh, lemming. Excellent, up you come. Um, so now, but not all of these are going to survive. So now we have to run this formula. So two lemmings doubled up to four lemmings. Um, so we do two times four, which is eight, divided by ten. So that's approximately one of these lemmings is not going to survive. Okay. Um, so uh, the three will. Um, so in order to find out who of you is going to survive, <laughs> we're going to play a game of musical lemmings. Um, so here we are, three chairs, four lemmings. Um, let's cue the lemming music. Okay. <laughs> so which one will survive? There are three going to survive, but one won't. You can do a bit of lemming boogieing if you want. Yeah, excellent. Oh, oh, oh there we go. Unfortunately, so we're going to kick her off over the cliff. So there she goes. Push. Over she goes. And we get three lemmings that survived. So very good. Give them a round of applause. But uh, we haven't stopped yet. So now's your chance. If you go, oh, I'd like to boogie like a lemming. Now's your chance. So up you get. So we have three lemmings survived. Um, but they double up now. So three, double up to six. Um, so it's uh, six lemmings. So I need three more lemmings. Okay. So. Um, Please get involved. It's all about, um, you know, maths isn't a spectator sport. It's an excellent, I can see you. Great. There's uh, one here, two more. How about, excellent, up you come. And, uh, yeah, come on, up, yeah, great. So um, we've got six lemmings now. So uh, as they're coming up, let me, let's, let's run the formula. So there's not enough food for all of them. So the formula says, okay, there's more lemmings around, so we're likely to lose more. So we do six times three, that's 18, divide by 10, that's roughly two are not going to survive. So um, we've got four that will, so we need an extra chair in here. Um, I didn't fill out a health and safety form for this, I'm really sorry. Uh, continuing it. It, it, you, if you t please don't tip over the other side here. So, um, um, anyway, let's cue the lemming music. <laughs> if I did not have two, we'd like the dust. Oh, I like the lemming boogieing here. <laughs> Vicious! <laughs> well, I think you have been kicked off, so I'm sorry that the boogieing saved her. So let, we'll kick these two off. There they go. And four survived. Okay, so up you come. But four double up to eight. So I'm going to need another um, four lemmings. So uh, now's your, up you come. Great, excellent. And how about you two? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah good. Right. And you can come as well. There you go. Unless there's something bursting to get up. Um, so now, gosh, we've got this pretty crowded up here um, on the cliff face. Um, let's run the formula. So now we've got... Oh, ooh, right. Yep, um, let me, uh, so we've got four lemmings, four doubles up to eight. So four times eight, um, 32, divided by 10. That's roughly three are going to die. So I need another chair in there. <laughs> Where are we going to stick that one? Um, 
Yes, we've got to do, do a pentagon now. Yeah, excellent. So, 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 geometry at work. There was a use to that geometry. Okay, so be really careful over there. So, uh, uh, <laughs> okay, cue the landing music. So three is the magic number. Three are not going to survive. Five will. No hovering, madam. Oh, unbelievable. <laughs> Terrible hovering going on. Okay, let's uh, fight it out. Oh, have I got? Oh, I, 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 I think that hovering yeah, exactly. So we'll kick them off. So three got lost, <laughs> and we've got five left. Now, don't worry, you're not going to have to do it again because something really, really, quite interesting happens now. So five of you, let's stand you up. So five made it through. But what happens now with this formula is that five doubles up to ten. 5 times 10 is 50, divide by 10, 5 dies. So interestingly, the population has grown, but now it stabilizes. And from now on, you just have, with this little model, 5 um, from now on. So this, this little model, where it doubles every season, you run the formula, you get stability. So let's give our 5 surviving lemons a round of applause. Thank you very much. So, um, uh, and it happens that if I started with a lot, it would have come down to five. Um, and, and so th this is what happens when the population doubles. Um, but when you change the, the quotient, you know, the amount of lemmings that get uh, born each season, so for example, if I tripled it, so make the lemmings a little bit more um, uh, productive, so, so it goes from, uh, say, two to, uh, so for example, if I ran two to, um, the double to, to six, then you run this formula. What you find now is that you don't get a stability, you get it ping-ponging between two values. It goes back and forwards from five to eight. Um, so that change in the, the uh, production of the uh, lemmings from one season to another can produce a different behavior. So now you get this ping-ponging. If you whack it up a little bit more to 3.5, then you start to see the behavior that you see in these lemmings. So every four years, now we have four different values which it ping-pongs between. And every fourth year, um, the population kind of plummets. And that's the reason that we're seeing this four-year cycle where suddenly there are none and then it starts to pick up again. You get three years of ping-pong around and then it descends again. But the intriguing thing is if you push it a little bit further and take it up so the, the population quadruples every season, then suddenly this kind of rather periodic regular behavior suddenly disappears and chaos ensues. It's like being suddenly in that region, the fractal region of that picture where you don't know where the, the pendulum is going to end up. So here is what happens when you have uh, the quadrupling. And again, if you just throw in one extra lemming into that, it can cause the graph to go in a completely different way. So, um, so this, is, I mean, this is an important point to know because you might think, if you looked at this graph, that maybe there was some environmental factor or some, uh, some uh, human intervention which caused the population suddenly to, to plummet at this stage. But, but using the mathematics, you can understand, no, actually this is just purely a, a function of uh, the, the, the equation that runs the way the population dynamic works. Um, so, and there's, there's a lot of examples in, in sort of the natural world where you get this kind of... Um, shift between um, uh, chaos and regular behavior. Turbulence, for example, that's another area that we do not understand at all. But turbulence obviously affects so many things, you, you know, when you're flying in the airplane or um, the fluids flowing through um, uh, pipes and things. You need to know when things are going to go from this rather regular behavior to chaotic behavior. Now, I think that um, of all of the science, it is mathematics which is the most powerful of being able to, to understand the things that we can know and the things that we can't know. And if you'd like to find out more about the power of mathematics, then continuing education is actually, um, we've devised an online course called the Number Mysteries course. It's a 10-week course which takes you a little bit further and deeper into these stories. Um, you can run some experiments, uh, um, uh, join up online with uh, other people on the course to actually um, find out a little bit more about the, the extraordinary power of this language of mathematics. So thank you very much.